So we are going to start diving in the first system we talk about, that is Ray, which is for to support next generation AI applications, including reinforcement learning. You heard quite a bit so far. So we are going to start with a talk, which will be given by Robert and Philip, and then we are going to follow up with a one hour and a half tutorial. Okay, so without further ado, Robert and Philip is going to, they are going to present Ray. Thank you. Hi, um, so I'm Robert and this is Philip, and we're going to tell you about Ray, which is one of the RISE Lab projects. Um, it's a number of people in the lab are working on Ray, and they'll all be around here today uh, to help with the tutorials and uh, answer questions. So the most fun part of this is actually going to be right after this talk, where we're going to work through, we're actually going to use Ray, um, and we're going to work through different exercises, um, and that, that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, so Ray is a system, a distributed execution framework for AI applications, for machine learning applications. So to understand why we need a new system for AI applications, it's important to understand how machine learning applications are changing. So today when we think of machine learning, we think of supervised learning. So supervised learning has been a huge success story. Um, it's a framework for making predictions, for applying labels to data, and things like that. So a canonical example is you take in an input data point, such as a photograph, um, and apply a label to it, uh, such as a description of what object is in the image. So supervised learning has been um, used with a ton of success for problems like machine translation, for problems like object recognition and speech recognition. Um, and it's been so successful that it's becoming more of a primitive that you can wrap up in a black box and use as part of more end-to-end, -end, more comprehensive applications. So a lot of the applications that we're thinking about now don't involve just making predictions. Of course they involve making predictions, but then they're using those predictions to take actions in the real world um, and to actually change the environment. Um, and that gets into some of the reinforcement learning stuff that Roy was talking about. So, uh, so when we think about end-to-end -end applications, supervised learning is one part of the picture, but there are a lot of other surrounding components. It's hard to do supervised learning if you aren't also doing some sort of feature extraction. It's hard to do optimization if you aren't doing some sort of hyperparameter search. So the challenge of building systems to support AI applications is that you have to uh, support not just, not just build a system for one of these uh, computational patterns, but you have to support all of them efficiently. And um, once you're doing that, then that enables the kinds of cap applications that we're talking about, the kinds of applications we're interested in, things like intelligence assistance, things like uh, dialogue systems, where you're making predictions, yes, um, and you're also using those predictions as part of a more a uh, comprehensive pipeline in which you are then using those predictions to take actions, and these actions are changing the environment. So, um, so what are the challenges on the system side for building systems to support these applications and these computational patterns? Well, uh, I'm going to divide them up into two axes. So first there's performance, and there's flexibility. Um, and and these, these applications are very diverse. So building systems that support the union of all of these applications is, is, uh, um, is pretty challenging. In terms of performance, things have to, uh, there's no question, things have to scale to hundreds of nodes. Um, you know, we all know that machine learning applications are very computationally intensive, uh, very data intensive. So we have to be able to uh, divide that, distribute that computation at least over, you know, over very large multi-core machines, over very large clusters. Uh, we have to be able to efficiently uh, share data within machines and serialize and deserialize data rapidly. Uh, Philip will talk more about some of the innovations we're doing there um, in the architecture section of the talk. Um, then another challenge is just the, the diversity of, of requirements. So some uh, applications require very long running tasks. Some require huge volumes of very tiny tasks. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of flexibility, you know, you have to be able to implement all of these different computational patterns, all of these different, uh, these different um, applications. And to do that, you need a lot of flexibility in the kinds of computations you can express. So that means you need to be able to have arbitrary tasks that are doing arbitrary things and have arbitrary dependencies on one another. Um, 
You need to be able to create tasks on the fly in response to observations that you're seeing in, uh, as your application is running. You need to be able to have stateful computation and mutable state that is shared between different tasks. Um, you know, you may need to decide that some task is taking too long and you don't want to wait for it to finish, so you're gonna, your application is going to make some other decision in that time. Um, and so, as all of this is happening, uh, you need the system under the hood that is, is capable of, of implementing all of these different requirements. So, uh, so now I'm going to talk about how you would actually use Ray, what the API looks like, and how it supports these flexibility requirements through the API. Um, and then Philip is going to talk about the architecture and the performance requirements. So how would you actually use Ray? Well, uh, here are a couple regular Python functions. So the first one creates um, a matrix of zeros, and the second one uh, multiplies two matrices together. So to translate this into Ray, um, we would first uh, add this Ray.remote decorator on the top of these functions. That turns it into uh, a remote function. And now, when we call one of these remote functions, whereas normally in Python, um, it would block, execute the function, and return the result, here it is immediately returning a future, or an object ID, and then um, creating a task that is scheduled somewhere in the cluster. Um, so here we're creating three tasks, um, and then to actually uh, get the results of one of these tasks, um, you can call ray.get, which is a blocking call, um, and we'll wait until the task finishes executing and return the result. So under the hood, this is constructing a computation graph which looks something like this. There are three tasks being created, the two zeros tasks and the one dot task. Um, there are three objects being created in blue. Um, and there are some dependencies. So this, the dot task, the third task, depends on the first two tasks. So you can already see, in terms of the parallelism that's exposed here, um, the two zeros tasks can be executed in parallel, but the third task has to wait until the first two tasks have run before it can execute. And the way that, uh, so the way that this uh, graph is constructed by the system uh, from the script that we're running on the left is that uh, we're passing these object IDs, the outputs of the first two tasks, as arguments into the third task. So that constructs dependencies between the, the first two tasks and the third task. Um, so this is about, this is about half of the, the API right here. One of the design goals here was to make it very easy to take existing Python code and uh, distribute it over a cluster without too many modifications to the actual code. Um, so this already allows you to, to do a lot of things, to uh, expose a lot of parallelism. Um, one thing it doesn't let you do is it doesn't let you, um, share mutable state between workers and between tasks. So the way we do that is through an actor abstraction. So I'll tell you about that now. Um, so this is a regular Python class. Um, it has one method which just increments a counter. So it's just a toy example. Um, and here we're calling that increment method three times. So we have a, a counter object and we're just incrementing a counter. There's no, there's no parallelism here. Um, because these three methods have to execute uh, one after the other to achieve the same results. But um, we can execute it remotely in a non-blocking way. Um, and the way we do that in Ray is to, des uh, to add this counter decorator, or uh, sorry, add this ray.remote decorator at the top. Um, that turns the class into an actor class. And now when we instantiate the class, um, the instantiate the actor, that actually creates a new worker process somewhere in the cluster. Um, and then uh, method calls turn into tasks that are scheduled on that newly created worker. So, um, and like the remote functions on the previous page, um, these actor methods return object IDs uh, or futures, uh, which can be retrieved with ray.gets and can be composed with other tasks and other actor methods to encode dependencies. Um, so the, the computation graph for this pattern looks something like this. Uh, we have um, four, four methods or tasks being run and three objects being produced. The, the four methods are the three, act, the three increment method calls, and then the first one is the constructor for the, for the actor process. Um, and uh, the cool thing here is that these, um, these, so the actor part of the API and the remote function part of the API, these are not 
sort of two separate things and you either use one or the other. These are, uh, you, they sort of interact seamlessly within the same scripts, so the same workloads, the same computation graphs. Um, and, you know, you can pass actor, I, uh, object, uh, like, uh, you can pass objects, the result of a, uh, some remote function into an actor method and vice versa, and you can, you know, spawn some task from within an actor method, and, and they just interoperate very seamlessly to produce a nice stateful data flow abstraction. Um, and this is, this, these, the combination of these two things really allows you to express a huge variety of, of applications. Um, one last thing I want to mention about the API is just that supporting GPUs well is super important. If you want to designate that an actor or a remote function requires a certain number of GPUs. Uh, the way we're doing that right now is uh, by passing that uh, as a flag into the remote decorator, and then when that's scheduled somewhere, uh, the appropriate number of GPUs will be reserved for that task. Um, so, so now Philip is going to tell you more about the architecture. Okay, let's now talk about the architecture, which allows us to um, support both um, the performance requirements that Robert talked about and also um, the flexible API. Um, okay, so um, <coughs> um, you would run Ray on a cluster. In this case, um, uh, I um, uh, wrote down three nodes, and on each of the nodes there are a number of processes. So there would be one driver process per job. And this could, for example, be a Jupyter notebook that you're running where you submit some tasks and then monitor what is going on with the computation. Or it could be some long-running Python process um, that you're starting. Um, and then you would have a number of worker processes. So typically we have one worker process per CPU core. One thing that is especially um, important for us is to support the high um, core setting that is nowadays common in um, um, cloud settings like EC2, where each machine might have like 100 uh, or something like this. And to support this well, um, we implement a shared memory object store, which allows us to share data between um, worker processes without, um, um, uh, with very um, small um, serialization and deserialization overhead, and also without having to copy the data between um, worker processes. Um, and we actually use um, for data serialization um, a project called Apache Arrow, which is a common data format for um, big data systems. And we wrote um, a serialization format that um, supports pretty much arbitrary Python types um, on top of Apache Arrow and um, exposes the shared memory so that um, large chunks of the objects don't have to be copied between workers. And um, both the in-memory object store and the serialization has now been um, merged into the Apache Arrow project because we think that these can be widely useful also outside of the Ray project. Um, and um, the object store also supports things like um, transferring um, objects between um, nodes in the cluster, and um, it also does object lifetime management, and a VIX objects and things like that. So then um, uh, and we have um, one local scheduler per node, and this is again to support the large multi-core setting. Um, and um, drivers, for example, or workers can submit tasks to the local scheduler, and then the scheduling will be done in a bottom-up fashion, where the local scheduler can um, schedule many tasks already locally without um, having to um, uh, go to a different node if object dependencies are already available locally. And workers can also submit um, tasks. And then if um, the either the capacity of the node is exceeded or um, the objects are not available locally, then um, the local scheduler will forward the task to the global scheduler, which will then assign it to another node. Um, another important feature of the system is the um, global control store. This is used to store all the um, control state of the system, which allows us um, to have a stateless design where most of the parts of the system are stateless. And this is um, very nice for achieving fault tolerance. Um, it's also used as a message bus, message bus to um, communicate between all the processes. And um, because all the control state is stored in a central location, um, we can, it makes it much easier to debug the system and to develop tools for debugging, profiling, or also for our web UI. Um, okay, uh, so um, to summarize, um, sort of I would say the three um, important parts of the architecture are the shared memory object store, um, the bottom-up scheduling, and the global control store. 
Okay, so let's now see how this architecture allows us to achieve the sort of performance goals um, that Robert was talking about. Um, and this plot on the x-axis, um, we plot the number of nodes. And on the y-axis, um, you have the tasks per second. And as you see, the scaling is um, um, approximately linear. And um, on 50 nodes, we can get um, 1 million tasks per second throughput. Also, in terms of the latency, um, um, in terms of local th um, um, scheduling decisions, we can schedule tasks, so schedule tasks, execute tasks, and get the result for like a very small tasks. Uh, um, can be done in uh, 300 microseconds. And um, to do the same thing on a remote uh, node um, can be done in um, about a millisecond. So as I mentioned, um, Ray is also fault tolerant. And um, here's an experiment that demonstrates this. So we start off with um, 20 machines. So in red here, you see the number of machines. And then in blue, you see the task throughput. So we start off with 20 machines. And then after 25 seconds, we um, remove one machine from the cluster. Um, and as you see, there's a dip in the um, task throughput. And that's because um, all the objects that were on that node are going to be reconstructed from the lineage that is stored in the, um, in the global control state um, by the other nodes. And then um, after some time, the task throughput goes back to normal. And then we um, switch off half the cluster. And then again, we get a dip from the reconstruction. Um, the task throughput goes um, up again. And then after we bring up uh, back again all the nodes, the um, task throughput is back to normal. OK, so um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, an end-to-end -end application um, that, is, um, that we implemented on top of Ray. And actually, you will implement a sort of a toy version of this um, later in the tutorial, in the RL tutorial. Um, and um, this is a cool new algorithm that was published by um, OpenAI a, a while ago. It's called Evolution Strategies. And um, it's uh, used to, um, in this case, we use it to train um, a 3D humanoid. So um, there's a simulator, which is a physics simulator of multi-body dynamics. And in each time step, it gives an observation of the current state. So this includes the position and velocities of all the joints, and also reward. So in this case, we want to learn running. And then uh, the reward would be the forward velocity. And um, zero if the head drops below a certain um, threshold. That's because otherwise the agent sort of learns to roll instead of walk. Um, these observations are then um, fed into a policy, which is a, um, a neural network. In this case, a fully connected neural network. And then um, it outputs um, actions, um, which are fed into the simulator. So the actions in this case is um, torques on the joints. And the general idea of the algorithm is just to try lots of different policies and see which one works best. Um, so here's a little bit of pseudo code, how you would implement that um, using serial Python. So this code would run like on, a, on one slide, for example. So we have a worker class, which has a simulation method, and it takes um, as an uh, argument the policy and the seed, and then it performs the simulation in the simulator and returns the reward. So then what we do is we create a number of workers, in this case 20 workers, and we initialize some initial policy. And then we do some iterations of the algorithm. So in this case, 200 iterations. In each round, we generate some new seeds for the simulation. Then we, um, do all the, we uh, execute all the simulations on the different workers with the policy um, and collect all the rewards. And then at the end of the iteration, we compute an update. So we propose a new policy um, uh, which incorporates the feedback from the last iteration and improves the policy to do better. Um, OK, so uh, this would take quite a while to train uh, on a single core. And therefore, we want to parallelize it. And um, how do we do this using Ray? So we use the um, at Ray remote decorator to make this worker class into an actor. Um, and then when we create the, um, the workers, we um, say worker.remote, which will create the worker um, either on the same machine or on a different machine in a separate process. And then when we do the rollouts, we um, do them remotely. So this means they will be executed on the remote um, um, actor. And all of these will be done in parallel. And then at the end, we can um, get the results. So these will return object IDs, which we can then um, get using write.get. Um, and this will um, ship the um, rewards, which are just scalars in this case. That's what makes the algorithm really scalable to the driver. And then we can update the policy and then do the next um, round of simulations. And um, here's some performance numbers. So um, this is very easy to implement on top of Ray. Um, we, um, we have some reference impl implementation, which is sort of a special um, system that is built for this algorithm. 
um, and then we compare with Ray. And so, um, first of all, the implementation is much easier. Um, it's about half the amount of code, and we could implement it in a couple of hours. Um, and um, one of the benefits of using Ray is also that it scales much better. So um, both on, um, on the same number of nodes, we get higher number of um, simulation steps per second. And also, um, the reference implementation actually um, doesn't scale um, beyond, beyond 30 nodes. Whereas with Ray, we can, for example, easily scale on 50 nodes and get um, um, over 500k um, states per second. Okay, so this is an example how such a policy would look like. So this is showing um, over the number of iterations of the algorithm how well the humanoid does. So at the beginning, the policy is random, and so it just falls down. And then it learns a little bit to balance itself, and, um, um, and after 100 iterations, it also makes already makes some uh, limited forward progress, but it still falls down. And then after 200 iterations, it uh, sort of already learned um, to walk but still false. And then after 500 iterations, it actually learns a very nice walking or running gait. Um, even walks off the screen. Um. Okay. Um, so um, to conclude, um, Ray is a system for AI applications, and it is open source on GitHub as um, all software that we are developing. And um, you can install it now um, also via pip install, very easy. And um, obviously, we'd love your feedback, and um, we're looking forward to um, going through the exercises with you, and yeah. Thanks. Oh yeah, um, um, now it's time for questions. Hello. Yeah, so, so far, it uh, looks like what you showed is actually a distributed uh, framework for doing simulations, but you didn't talk much about the algorithm of the reinforcement learning itself, is that right? Um, yeah, I mean, um, this algorithm is fairly simple. We um, uh, are actually working on a reinforcement li library on top of Ray, which implements a bunch of um, more um, complex algorithms. Like, um, we, are, um, we have an evolution strategies implementation, and then we have a policy proximal policy gradient implementation, okay. we have A3C, and um, we have DQN, we have a bunch of algorithms that are implemented on top of Ray. Okay. Um, if you are interested in learning more, we can talk um, after the talk. Okay. Oh, yeah. And there's also a sanction. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so the architecture that you showed, uh, where you had the workers and the schedulers, is there an uh, implementation where I could run this on top of Mesos cluster or Kubernetes instead of spinning up a different cluster for less running uh, uh, reinforcement learning? Yeah, so in the past, we've actually run it on top of Kubernetes. And um, there's no like open source, um, and we haven't like open sourced anything with that, but it definitely works um, to run it. Uh, we are, um, as part of the distribution, we have some shell scripts that allows you to pretty easily develop, um, like deploy it on, a, on an EC2 cluster or like bare metal cluster. Um, but it's definitely also possible to do it on Kubernetes, for example. Um, uh, can you tell us anything about uh, the tools you use to implement the, sh the shared memory space that the different jobs can access? Is this something you wrote yourself or that were there did you use existing tools? Yeah, so we implemented the object store ourselves. Um, so the sort of tools that are um, involved here, it's written in C++ and like it's using POSIX, MAP, like shared memory. Um, and then there's a, a little bit of um, um, extra things on top of it. Like for example, I'm doing the reference counting, so to be able to tell which objects are being used and which ones can be safely evicted. And then there's also things like eviction policies, um, so um, um, to um, evict the, the objects that are not um, in use. And then there's also some limited synchronization primitives on top of it um, that you can use to um, see when objects are available and things like that, and to get to query the status of the objects. And uh, it's all open source, and we recently merged that into Apache Arrow, um, so, yeah. So for message processing, you said that everything goes through the global um, database. Um, yeah. But if the workers, uh, if you have two workers that are local and the communication is local, why not talk locally rather than distributedly? So um, actually, um, uh, if you can do everything on the single node um, through the local scheduler, um, then the global control source that is not on the critical path. So, so um, locally on the node, you can like have uh, very fast scheduling decisions. And then, um, if you go um, beyond uh, the node, then you need to go through the like message bus, and that will also lock um, the tasks in the global control store. Um.
Any more questions? So previously you're using, I think, NumPy. Uh, so do you have any other libraries that's supporting this, like TensorFlow or Tiana? Yeah. So we actually use for most of our, um, uh, like reinforcement learning work and uh, machine learning work, we use TensorFlow. Um, so we have some, uh, a little bit of integration that allows you to like um, read out the, the data and, and things like that um, from TensorFlow. Um, and there are examples in the code base. Um, okay. And uh, do you also have any bindings for scikit-learn? Okay. Uh, so yeah, one of the things is um, if you want to use scikit-learn, for example, you just like import it and then you just use it like um, in, in the worker processes, and it's not really necessary to write like any bindings. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. So now I think we're going to transition to the exercises. Um, so I think everyone should have. Um, an account and password, is that correct? If you do not have one, can you raise your hand? Okay. So I believe the way to do this is that everyone wants to go to, is it tech dot or risecamp or something? Yeah, risecamp.tech. Risecamp .tech. Um, so, right. So everyone's going to go to risecamp.tech. Um, can you all see that? Um, Okay, um, and uh, once you do that, you'll be prompted for a, uh, a like account and password. So, have you guys successfully done this? Can you raise your hand if you have successfully managed to get to this page? Okay, and um, if you have not, can you raise your hand also so that someone can help you? Okay, great. Wow. Um, so. To, for, so let's start off by, for this section of the uh, exercises, we're gonna, you're going to click on the Ray folder. Um, and, uh, but note that at the top level, these are, this, this whole directory contains all of the exercises that we'll be going through today. Um, and, uh, and so later on, we're going to come back and go through the, the Clipper one and the RL and Pong ones uh, today, and then the other ones are for tomorrow, I believe. Um, so you're going to click on the Ray folder, uh, click on Exercises, um, and you're going to see 10 different Jupyter notebooks. Um, and so the plan is for everyone to work through these uh, sequentially on your own, um, starting with exercise one. So if you click on that, um, we're going to, so we're going to start off by working through the first exercise. Uh, and we're going to uh, independently, and then we're going to check in in about four or five minutes and, um, and make sure we're all on the same page about, about this. And then, um, and then work through the remaining exercises. So, uh, so to do this one, um, you know, uh, if you haven't used Jupyter before, um, the way you, you click on one of these cells and you can hold sh type shift enter to actually run the, to actually execute this Python, these Python uh, commands. Um, so, uh, so the way to do this is you'll want to read through some of the, uh, the instructions. And the, these, these, this documentation explains the concepts that you'll need for these exercises. Um, you're going to want to just run all of the cells, pretty much. Um, and when you actually get to this box with, that says uh, at the bottom, um, it's going to throw an exception because the code that you ran above was too slow. And then you're going to have to go back and look at the exercises and actually parallelize this example using Ray. To, uh, to then, and once you do that, then when you run this box, it will, uh, everything will be fast enough um, and it won't raise an exception, it'll succeed. So, uh, so, so why don't we all work through this ourselves and, and then we'll check in in a few minutes. If you have questions uh, or run into problems, please raise your hand and someone will come around and, okay, so we already have some questions. Um, great. If you have questions that you think might be uh, broadly applicable to people, you can also just, uh, um, I can answer that up here.
fill up. Um, so if people, if you hear people, if you hear questions that people have that are uh, that are probably going to apply to a lot of people, then we should announce it up here. Can you raise your hand if you've managed to if do exercise one? Okay, great. So I'm going to go through that one on the uh, uh, up on the projector, and and then we're going to continue working on the remaining exercises. And if you if you've already finished this and it's it's straightforward, then you know uh, then uh, some of the exercises, uh, some of the subsequent ones will be a little more challenging. Um, but uh, for the people who are still working on this one, I'm going to uh, show you how to do it up here. So the first thing we're doing is we're running, uh, we're starting Ray with the ray.init command. Um, then we're going to run this slow function, and we're going to want to run it in parallel a number of times. So the way we, the, there are three things we have to do to, to parallelize this code. So we're defining the slow function here, and we're calling it in a loop four times over here. Um, and so that's going to, since it sleeps for one second, the whole loop is going to take four seconds. Um, and so as a simple example of how you can run tasks in parallel, there are three things you have to do. First, we have to modify the slow function to be a remote function by adding the ray.remote decorator on top. Um, then when we actually call the slow function, we have to invoke it with 
uh, slow function dot remote. And lastly, um, when we uh, now this list of results, um, it used to be uh, a list. We used to be appending um, the actual value returned by slow function, and now we're appending a future. So now results is a list of futures. So we have to actually retrieve the value, um, the actual results that we're interested in. So we can say results equals ray dot get of results. And now when we run that, um, it should only take one second. Um, and if we run this box here, uh, we can see that it, it took about a second. So the cool part here is um, we can visualize this using um, the UI. Um, so normally our UI is a Jupyter notebook, but here it's just embedded. Uh, the, the relevant widget is embedded, embedded in um, uh, uh, the, it, within this Jupyter notebook. So the relevant thing here is that you can see there are four tasks. Each of these boxes is one task, and they're being executed in parallel. So it's here time is going from left to right, and we can see that these tasks are, are being executed in parallel. Um, and we can see when they started and when they stopped. Um, now if you click on view, uh, view options and uh, click on select flow events, that will show the, as arrows, it'll show the task, the dependencies between the tasks. Uh, there are no dependencies in this example, so, uh, so that doesn't do anything, but in subsequent examples, it'll be pretty useful. Um, and this, this timeline visualization, uh, can you raise your hand if the timeline visualization worked for you? If you can, if you manage to see it? Okay, if you didn't, then someone will come around and, uh, um, and help you in a second. Um, but uh, this will be useful for some of the subsequent exercises, especially exercise three, for seeing... Uh, uh, in exercise three, we're implementing a tree reduce, so aggregating a bunch of things, uh, objects in a tree structure. Um, and you can actually see that in the timeline visualization. You can see what's happening in parallel or what is not. Um, so that comes in handy for debugging performance. Um, okay. And uh, so now let's all work through the, continue to work through the exercises independently. And uh, if you run into problems, please raise your hand and, and we'll come around and help you.